having a problem with this little four-letter combination for quite some time now. And um, the problems are multiple, the content and the procedure, and we're going to fight both. So we are now in the process of preparing the parliament. Oh, excellent. Hi. Hi, welcome. Good, very good. We just actually just informed everybody that there is coffee and uh, sugar over there in the form of cakes. That's very important if you want to think. And um, I just said that who we are organizing this, but I guess you might know Christian who's standing up, Judith sitting there, and Carl who's sleeping here. So we welcome you. And um, we talked about the ACTA process and the ACTA content. And we try to fight both. And um, in the process, we will talk about what is the possibilities and how can we win a majority for bringing it to court. And on the content, we will try to explain why the parliament should say no. And uh, unless they revert back to the logic of or act as original stated goals on dealing with massive scale of infringements on, uh, on goods, that's a different thing than the act of content today. And we have some experts with us. And without further ado, I would actually like to start that process. And, uh, is it Judith who will take over the next step in the discussion? Yes. But it is not such a difficult task. My name is Judith Sarfati. I'm from the Netherlands, also a Korean MP. And I think I only have to introduce Joe McNamee, uh, who's sitting straight next to me, right next to me, who will explain us. Um, the struggle you've been going through um, uh, to get access to uh, to the documents on ACTA, um, and the preparatory works which confirmatory applica uh, applications have been filed, to what extent the efforts have been successful, implications and possible outcomes and actions. And when you're talking jargon, I'll, I'll stop you and ask you what it means, because maybe you all know, but. But to me, it is sometimes very possible. Um, Joe, please. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name, as Judith said, is Joe McNamee. I work with an organization called European Digital Rights, which is an association of 28 digital civil rights organizations from 18 European countries. Uh, as ACTA proceeded from draft to draft, uh, various texts were leaked into the public, and a lot of the text has no obvious meaning, which makes it difficult to interpret. And some of the texts which appears to have an obvious meaning, uh, we can't get confirmation that that's what it means. Um, so the question is, how on earth do you find out what ACTA means? So um, in response to a parliamentary question by a um, French MEP, uh, François Castex, the European Commission confirmed that the Vienna Convention on uh, Treaties applies. And this means that if text is unclear, then uh, recourse can be had to the preparatory documents uh, of the text in question. So the question then was, if the secret behind ACTA is in the preparatory documents, what do the preparatory documents mean? Well, the preparatory documents haven't been released officially, so we still don't know what it means. Um, there's reference in one footnote in where uh, the text talks about cooperation between internet providers and rights holders. Um, and the footnote explains that this cooperation includes measures as serious as disconnecting people from the internet. This, is, this means that the European Union and the United States and our partners would be entering into a text, entering into an agreement where third countries whose um, fundamental rights uh, legislation we have criticised whose privacy legislation we formally do not recognize as adequate in comparison with European privacy legislation, would be taking measures to uh, investigate and prosecute um, citizens outside the rule of law and disconnect them from, from the internet. 
However, that document has never been made public, so we can't say officially that that's what it means. There is a strange reference to the use of fair process, the fundamental principle of fair process um, in ACTA. And the fundamental principle of fair process is interesting because the fundamental principle of fair process exists in nowhere in international law except in the draft act of the text. There's no, there's no fundamental process. There's no fundamental principle of fair process. It's just a reference to the fundamental principle of fair process. The fundamental principle of fair process does, however, uh, appear in uh, OECD documents. Um, and the OECD documents also talk about privatized enforcement by internet providers. And civil society tried repeatedly in the OECD uh, to say either you explain fair process or you put in due process because that's what the fundamental principle is. And the states in the OECD have uh, permanently, have consistently refused. Um, Christian Engstrom has tabled a parliamentary question saying, um, what is this fundamental principle that you're talking about? And uh, the Commission referred uh, him to uh, TRIPS, a TRIPS article which doesn't mention fair process as explaining what the fundamental <coughs> principle of fair process is. Uh, Christian has now tabled another parliamentary question saying, that doesn't make sense, can you please explain? And we're waiting for a response to that. So there are, there's a clue in the footnote as regards what cooperation means. There's a, um, a clue in the OECD as regards what pro fair process doesn't mean, namely due process. And there was an interesting presentation yesterday by Jamie Shea from the um, from NATO, uh, who was explaining um, cyber attacks, uh, which seems completely unrelated. But he, he was explaining that it's all about effect. So um, stealing money from a bank by electronic means is exactly the same as having a, uh, an armed attack on the, um, on the same bank. So you should look at the effect and not at the actual crime in order to establish the, uh, whether it's a crime or not. Um, so if you then say, okay, an ISP that allows 10,000 individual downloads uh, is having an effect uh, of commercial scale, then you, you see what, what is becoming commercial scale. So, so ISP providers are organized crime. Um, well, yes. I mean, if you use the definition that has mysteriously come from the former press spokesman who's now cybersecurity uh, head, chief of uh, NATO, um, a, a promotion that is a bit of a mystery to me, then uh, that's, um, yeah, Mr. that's she, you mean. Mr. Shea, yeah. Mr. Shea. Um, so we asked, we sent a letter to the Intercommittee in May saying uh, thank you very much to the Parliament for all of its, uh, for its four votes in favour of transparency. Um, uh, the Parliament, the Commission has said that the um, Vienna Convention applies. The Commission says you have all of the documents. May we have the documents, please? Two months later, the Commission, the, the Intercommittee responded and said, why are you asking us? And we responded and we said, because you apparently have the documents and you're the institution that has said there should be transparency. They then responded with lots of uh, documents which were not particularly interesting. They didn't provide a, um, a, the digital chapter with the, with the footnote which explains uh, that cooperation means measures as serious as cutting people off. And in the meantime, the Parliament had, it appears accidentally, published the leak of the digital chapter on the European Parliament's website together with a uh, copyright infringement, apparently, of a, um, a US, inside US trade article on ACTA. So we, we said, bearing in mind that um, the Parliament has made the text of the digital chapter um, public on its own website, and bearing in mind the seriousness of this, because if this is true, 
then this, the, the uh, cooperation that's being discussed would be contrary to the treaties. Um, you should give us the, um, the documents, please reconsider. And uh, last week we got uh, a response from the, uh, from the committee saying, no, you still may not have access to the document. That would be the text of which we have already published on the product website. They did, however, um, take down the text that they had previously published. Um, so we've come to the end of the, um, of the process, and all that is left for us now is to um, make a complaint to, to the Ombudsman. Uh, and uh, that's going to take X number of months, and it's unlikely that there's going to be a decision before um, a vote in the Parliament. But ultimately, the vote will come. The, 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 um, the Ombudsman uh, decision will come, and the Ombudsman will almost certainly decide that the European Parliament is uh, guilty of failing to respect transparency on a dossier where a majority of the European Parliament voted four different times to support transparency. So it's really quite a miserable position for the European Parliament to find itself in. Um, there's no other uh, option for us to ask again for the documents. Um, Libe Civil Liberties Committee is going to be doing a, um, an opinion on, uh, on ACTA. The Civil Liberties Committee has this text. The, the, European, the Civil Liberties Committee uh, must discuss, dis, dis, discuss this text uh, when it discusses ACTA, so this information will have to come out in the course of the legislative procedure, or the decision-making procedure, and that's that's everything to do with access to documents. Okay, maybe I should say something about that. Uh, I'm the coordinator for the Greens and the Civil Liberties Committee. So <coughs> the request um, for a um, for a report on ACTA came from us, and we used a rule in the rules of procedure of this house. I think from the top of my head it's 63, but it could be 36. Apologies. Anyway, it's a rule that says that the Civil Liberties Committee is entitled to to look into uh, treaties uh, to see whether they uh, harm the fundamental rights of European citizens. Uh, we can only do that if a group or an other committee asks for that. So the official request came from the Green Group and, and then the coordinators in the Civil Liberties Committee agreed on it. We still haven't appointed a rapporteur, so the whole thing is in motion but not uh, rolling very fast yet. It's the first time that we use this tool to, 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 to check whether a treaty is uh, um, in line with the fundamental uh, with the fundamental rights. So we're also writing history, and it might be a tool that we can use in in future, maybe sparsely, but 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 it's there. Um, I'm looking at our agenda, and I see that now uh, colleague Eva Lichtenberg is supposed to take over, but uh, she's not there, and I wonder whether there are also people that had questions about the story, about the, um, well, the story, I wouldn't say, about the spun-out complaint by Mr. McNamee mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, on the topic count. Yeah, I'm a member of the INTA committee, and uh, we are the committee responsible for dealing with the eventual adoption, or rather, if we get what we want, non-adoption of ACTA. But what I wanted to know, to I have a question to you, actually, Judith, and that is that when you do this, I mean, listen to what Joe said, it's really important that um, you also then ask for the different preparatory stages to do access to those documents in order to judge the impact on civil liberties, because we didn't have access to all the stages. We got, ac we got access to certain documents in this procedure, but definitely not all the versions and so on. So, and we didn't get the proper access. So the parliament has a rather ridiculous procedure where they think something is, is very important to keep secret. You have to go to a reading room and you have to sign in and you have a man looking at you and so on. And in this case, I remember one time we got distributed in committee and had to give the document back and so on. So, so 
Um, if you could really get access to all the documents in this procedure, it would be easier to judge uh, the, um, the civil right abuses that could contain in it. Because I have had a problem in all these procedures and all the verses I have seen so far. It's extremely difficult to make a clear judgment. I read the text in one way. And when I asked the Commission, because we had had several meetings also in the Inter Committee on this, and Every time I ask the Commission a question, they say, oh no, but that's not what we mean. Well, then I ask, why don't you just clarify it by writing it in this way instead, so it's clear to everybody who reads this document how it should be read. And they never give a satisfactory answer to on why it's formulated in an unclear way, if nobody means it should be interpreted in any other way than they say. So it's really important to see the formulation history of it, because I noticed in the first discussion in the intercommittee we had, I complained at five different things. And actually, all those five sentences have changed. It was on, on technical measures to uh, infringe copyright. It was on this cooperation clause. It was on that industry and, and government should promote copyright logic. And it was about if you may or shall exclude uh, individual travelers. And in, in all these five things changed, and four of them changed to a more unclear language. So, the question is, why? Um, you put the task on our shoulders. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Uh, we don't have a rapporteur yet. And I think uh, the, the length and the depth and the depthness of uh, the thoroughness of the report depends on, on who will be the rapporteur. Yeah. But we're also in a hurry. Um, I wouldn't mind um, if the statement that the outcome of the, of the NEPA committee is a, one that is clear on fundamental rights. If we then miss some articles, but it would be nice if there is a vote on a report in NEPA that says this is an infringement of our yeah. fundamental rights. That would help. Um, so can, I just, can I just add? Um, Exactly in line with what you said. Um, in response to Christian's uh, question on, on uh, fair process, the, uh, the answer from the Commission was, well, uh, the negotiators all knew that this text referred to, referred to that text, uh, even though that text doesn't contain the words fair process. And um, I, I believe that the legal service opinion uh, explains that the, um, the Property documents don't have a uh, legal meaning until such time that they uh, become public. So, um, if if documents subsequently become public after the Parliament uh, had voted yes, then they would have voted on something that was actually not what they thought they were voting. Um, I other questions to this. Um but I would find rather technical debate, not on ACTA, but on how we're dealing with it. If not, then um, I'm moving up. Uh, I think the leader for today, which is you, Carl, our, I mean, I see on our agenda now a, 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 a couple of very, again, fundamental questions that our colleague Eva Lichtenberg was supposed to give an answer to. That's quite challenging, and how do we um, proceed? Maybe John can pick up her. <laughs> John is also a member uh, of the Green Group and very involved in all these uh, digital rights issues, actually. So I should just answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Eva's not here. She, she was supposed to take the next uh, part of the procedure. Okay. If you do put me an agenda, I will try to answer it. Thanks for doing that, yeah. Or, who's Marie Humeau? I'm very sorry, that's you, Marie. <laughs> I'm very sorry, I mean, this is, uh, this is too, uh, I mean, we Greens, we are known for, for, for not being authoritarian, but we can overdo it at an early morning. <laughs> we, we could do with some structure. Marie, you will help us with these answers. Yeah. You could have stepped in and, and saved my butt, but... <laughs> <laughs> Marie um, uh, Humeau, also of, uh, of, uh, of EDRE, uh, will answer a number of questions on, on ACTA, which needs to be answered before the European Parliament decides on, uh, on our consent or not. 
uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check a little cup, I'll, 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 tell, uh, I'll name a couple and I'll give over to Marie. Uh, whether ACTA encourages fundamental rights violations by and in third countries, whether ACTA forces investment in internet technologies to protect various interests, such as copyrights, uh, copyright holders, filtering, deep packet inspection, blocking, whether ACTA opens up for internet service providers to use those technologies to interfere with trafficking for their own business proposals, and a couple of others. Marie, help us out. Um, good morning, I'm Marie Moore. I'm working with Joe at Edry, and I'll try to answer all these questions. Um, so, first question, whether ACTA encourage fundamental rights violation by and in third countries? Well, our answer is yes. As ACTA emphasized enforcement outside the rule of law, um, developing countries will uh, have to change their IP right enforcement regimes uh, to meet ACTA standards. And um, as ACTA doesn't set any safeguards, uh, it will for sure have a negative effect on all fundamental rights, such as freedom of speech, access to culture. Um, even if we look at the European situation now, where we've got the Charter and where we've got the European Convention on Human Rights, um, we see a situation where fundamental rights are in the bad position. So I'm going to give you three examples of it. Um, the first one is an example of access to information. We already in Europe have lots of lawyers who use coercive tactics to um, get to customers' data from ISPs. So, um, we then have a knock on effect on ISP liability. There has been a study in the Netherlands uh, led by Bits of Freedom where they upload a web page, create an Hotmail account, and send ISPs emails saying, well, there is copyright infringement there. And then uh, three fourths of the ISP removed the web page without even checking if there was a real copyright infringement. So they make it like fake accusations. Yeah, they fake it. <coughs> yeah. And nobody checked, and page was removed by three fourths of the ISP just to protect themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <coughs> finally, there is an, a risk on the enforcement and um, a potentially application of the three strikes rules, like we could have in Ireland, where ICOM is potentially voluntarily applying the three strikes rules. So that's for the first question. But uh, I'll ask a question. Um, you're now giving an example of Ireland where there's three strikes uh, and then you're thrown off the internet or your access to the internet is, uh, is, 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 is blocked. Uh, is possibly going to be implemented, or yeah. is it an ISP that that no, it's basically it's going to be is it law or is it an ISP that is an internet service provider that is moving on its own? Yeah. Yes. Um, an ISP uh, was taken to court by the music industry, and uh, it was on the point of winning its case, and it decided instead of winning that it would uh, negotiate a compromise. And the compromise it negotiated was that it would introduce voluntary uh, three strikes regime, and uh, that um, that involves the music industry uh, paying a company to collect IP addresses, passing them on to the ISP, the ISP contacting the consumer, and then theoretically, if the consumer gets contacted three times, then the third time their connection is discontinued, which is pretty much word for word how the the um, the digital chapter in, in ACTA is, is formulated, a voluntary arrangement between the ISPs and the rights holders. And there's a footnote on this point which is, um, without further explanation, is an obvious breach of the um, of EU law, uh, because uh, the, the footnote says that uh, nothing in the, in the in ACTA should prevent, should be used to stop introducing protections for price reliability as long as the reasonable expectations of the rights holders are uh, respected. So you have 
and you have the, the expectations of the rights holders on one level, the ISPs, and the knock-on effects for the society on a lower level. They're protected first, then everyone else. And um, that's exactly contrary to the, uh, Promus uh, the Telefonica Promusica ruling of the European Court of Justice. So that's, that's just a, a literal um, contradiction because the ECJ has said there has to be balance between rights. And as um, the Advocate General said in the Scarlet Savannah case, putting the rights of one industry out of the rights of society is not a balance. Yeah. So um, that would be one example where perhaps the, uh, the Commission could save itself with some priority documents explaining that that doesn't mean what it appears to be. But to be very clear, this settlement before court, this compromise, nowhere is the Irish government to be seen. Because so that I find the worrying part of it. So that's, a, that's, yeah, that's what the voluntary corporation is. So, we've got an issue with the number of rights. Um, the second question was whether active forces investment in internet technologies to collect values interests, such as copyright holders. Well, uh, the answer there is not really like yes or no, but it's not directly. Um, because of ACTA imposing extensive injunction powers, um, it would lead, it could lead to a situation such as digital threats in the Scarlet Savam case. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's in, in Belgium. Um, Savam is the uh, Belgian Collective Society for uh, Author and Composers. And um, they wanted uh, the internet service provider Scarlet to filter and block the potentially unlawful peer-to-peer -peer communication. So they asked for the court of Brussels, and the first instance said, well, Scarlet is not liable, but Scarlet has to put into place a system of filtering. So uh, Scarlet went appealed on this, and um, the court of appeal of Brussels is asking uh, preliminary ruling from the ECJ on that question. And the advocate general said it was going too far, but we don't have the ruling yet. It's coming at the end of the month. So, it could lead to this extensive injunction power. Could lead to um, new technology being put to filter and block. But then the <coughs> question is because when we claim this kind of things, the Commission always says yes, but we don't change anything in existing law with ACTA. That's their standard argument every time we find something we don't like in ACTA. So, uh, in which way would this influence? I mean, in some cases you could see because some things in ACTA affect European travellers when we move abroad and so on, but what things would affect a European citizen acting in and within Europe that would change ACTA according to you? Because the Commission always says we don't change anything. I have my doubts because some of the sentences are differently formulated than in the directive they're talking about, but still, what is your judgment on that? Um, well, uh, on the first part, we, we don't know. Um, the European Commission uh, in the iPred um, consultation uh, put in a, a very explosive one sentence which said that injunctions shouldn't be, may not necessarily be linked to liability. And that sentence was meant to say, and therefore we can ignore the e-commerce directive. Isn't that fun? Now, if the Scarlet Saban case goes one way, then it means one thing for, for Europe. If it, means, if it goes another way, it's disastrous. Um, but the e-commerce directive is subject to review coming up in the coming months. The e-commerce directive is subject to review in the coming months. Uh, there's actually a communication in December. Now, ACTA won't necessarily um, change the text, but the first thing it will do is severely limit what the European Union can do. Exactly. Uh, to rectify problems. To rectify problems. Which are, in, a directive, in directives that are 10 and 7 years old, respectively. And secondly, the, the Belgian courts decided that this mandatory general obligation to monitor of, of all uh, traffic on peer-to-peer -peer networks was a permissible thing to do um, under an injunction. 
you move that logic outside the European Union and you end up with that being implemented. Whereas in Europe, at least we have the European Court of Justice, which hopefully on the 25th of this month will decide uh, the opposite. And that then leads, leads to the question about the, the, the treaty. How exactly would that be considered to be compliant with the obligation in the, in the treaty for the European Union to support democracy and the rule of law in its international relations? Because we're talking about ISPs being either directly required under injunctions or coerced by a, a firestorm of injunctions to, um, to carry out mass, mass surveillance. And for me, that's, that's the most obvious uh, breach of the treaty uh, in, in, the whole, in the whole act. So, what are changes? Nothing in the words, but it means practically it's a hell of a lot more uh, significant. Uh, um, so, yeah, to finish on that question, um, as Joe already said, the international right orders are preserved first before all, all fundamental rights. And uh, as ACTA is only a minimal standard, um, there will probably be pressure to implement a uh, highest common standard in um, So we've got no way of knowing if uh, it will force investment in internet technologies, but um, there is a risk that party or different courts in different parties to ACTA um, will think that little or no liability for ISP. Uh, undermine IPY enforcement and therefore if that happens the ISP will be obliged to uh, invest in those kind of technology to protect themselves from liability. So probably. <laughs> um, whether, uh, the next question is whether ACTA opens up for internet service provider to use those technology to interfere with traffic for their own business purposes. Well, um, regarding recent developments, the answer is it's highly possible. Um, it won't if the market stays the same, but if we uh, look at the market at the moment, it's changing, and we've got some recent example I'm going to explain to you, um, that shows that it could be like this in a few years, if actually is implemented. So we've got um, content companies uh, providing access for customers only of certain ISPs. We've got a linked uh, agreement in, from the Netherlands, um, which shows that uh, some ISPs got access to customers and um, um, against like. Um, so they've got access to the, to the customers, and then the ISP is going to force them to build the customers. Yeah. And um, so the, the agreement, just explain a bit more. The, the content providers um, give access to the content on condition that there are certain things done by the ISP, such as um, voluntary measures involving um, voluntary measures. Um, Involving uh, the uh, blocking and, uh, and filtering. <coughs> so you can get access to, I don't, know, I don't want to pick on any particular provider of, uh, of content, but you can have access to Disney content if you do what Disney says uh, regarding how you uh, limit uh, unauthorized access to content on your network. So it's sort of a critical quo. Well, uh, there was a, 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 a contract in the Netherlands which was uh, leaked, which was basically exactly this type of uh, cooperation between rights holders and energy. Uh, Would you have a name? Um, I don't have it in front of me, and I, uh, I can provide it such um, This could be even more advanced uh, when the content provider are also the access provider, which is in the UK, in Germany. Um, and then 
then we also have this example of internet providers, such as Dutch Telecom and uh, British Telecom, who have already asked if they would be able to demand money um, from online companies to gain access to their customers. So it's a risk. It's an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for them, yeah. But it's a risk for the customer. Uh, are there people that right now after these couple of, I see people shaking their head of no, but and Eric making gestures, please go ahead. Um, we're talking about the uh, cooperation article uh, 273, I think, that says that each party shall, shall endeavor to promote cooperative efforts, uh, where the shall would be the binding obligation, but still the language there is a bit vague. Uh, regarding efforts within the business community to effectively address trademark and copyright infringements. Now, in the history of the versions uh, released, um, this particular article has, was much sharper in previous versions where it was explicit uh, pinpointing what kind of cooperation they wanted to have. And in the last version of this, there's a bit of closer. At the same time, that came in the article. Uh, it was introduced in the preamble, like um, uh, a sentence that the parties to the agreement desire to promote cooperation between service providers and rights holders to address relevant improvements in the digital environment. <coughs> My question is, what role does preamble, uh, the preamble sentences play in the interpretation uh, subsequently in the articles? Um, and are they, do they want like policy directions or how, how should you look at that particular sentence that the parties to the that, that desire to promote cooperation? Uh, the, the consequence, so subsequently then, if the consequence of the cooperation would be a breach of the obligation to promote democracy, then the desire to promote cooperation would be then to me, on, on, on a very simple level, as a direct conclusion. But that depends a bit on, on the, how the preamble sentences work legally. And it, it depends on what cooperation means. And that's, that's uh, where the uh, preferred documents come in. Um, it is entirely possible to have cooperation which respects uh, the rule of law, which respects democracy. <coughs> um, However, if you look at discussions that are going on in WIPO, if you look at discussions that are going on in the OECD, uh, the context is not that kind of cooperation. Um, so, um, until and unless the, the, that context is clarified, then um, it's either a gross and obvious breach of the, uh, of the uh, treaties or it might be, but we don't know because we don't uh, have a clarification. So, um, yeah. I think I would like to answer that also. I mean, the preambles are quite important. They give a direction of how you should interpret the legal text. But the more general the preamble is, so promote democracy, the less relevant it is in a way because, for example, some of the parties of the ACTA agreement thinks that you can combine democracy with another fundamental right to live, but they have a death penalty. So, so I mean, so if you say you have in favor of the death penalty, that goes over than the democracy right and fundamental right to live. So the more general something is, the less stringent the criterion is. So the more general thing like promote democracy, if there is another preamble saying control internet, then the control internet is, is what the dominating word is. So the more specific the preamble is, the more relevance it had to how to interpret the text. But they are quite important because they explain how you should interpret the articles when in doubt, together with the preparatory documents. Yeah. Um, I was just going to think more about the, um, um, what Ray said about the, the market. That's um, a little bit esoteric at the moment, but it's, <coughs> if you look at the um, the firestorm of, of lobbying in the industry committee over the past uh, few weeks on the net neutrality resolution, uh, you'll see that it's actually becoming quite a big issue. 
Um, the, the biggest internet access providers are very keen on creating, setting themselves up as gatekeepers for the internet. And um, there is, there are some that will, will remain nameless that are creating uh, filtering systems in the UK that have a, a planned business model to um, to filter outgoing traffic in order to uh, create marketing profiles of their own customers to uh, to resell to to advertise it. You've got uh, other access providers that want to monetize traffic coming in um, in order to uh, charge to um, set companies against each other and whoever pays the most gets access to, to, to their customers. Um, and if you if you talk to some of the very biggest internet providers at the moment, you will, there's a sudden very strange thing where the biggest internet providers are saying, you know, we should police the internet. Um, and uh, um, if you think of the absolutely biggest you can think of and invite them for a meeting, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, you, you should use names. We're in a very small group and, and it leaves me with question marks. Uh, okay, well, uh, we also have... Uh, we're also recorded. Um, <laughs> That's so, true. Um, so, so you, you, um, you've got a situation where you've got internet access providers being invited to interfere with, uh, with traffic and create, uh, become gatekeepers on the one hand. And the biggest internet access, access providers wanting an excuse to build the gate on the other hand. So you merge the two of those together and you create a completely different market um, where um, the biggest providers have got, um, can actually um, develop a whole new model out of, out of this, uh, this interference that wouldn't be possible if this voluntary interference wasn't being promoted. And, and I'll name names, I'll, and I'll take the risk. So I, I live in Amsterdam and I have my internet, my telephone and my TV from UPC, which is a big American company and, and they, they have more or less a monopoly in Amsterdam. Is it the same that transport things also? That's UPS. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm not talking nasty about UPS. <laughs> no, I, I'm with UPC. And I recently had a talk with them, and they said, and, and I said, but hey, you're making money on two sides. One, you're you're selling me broadband internet. Second, you're selling me uh, films on demand through my TV uh, set. So doesn't it level out? And they said, no, it doesn't. Uh, the, the 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 TV on demand, the film on demand branch of UPC would be very happy with a three strikes out or whatever ruling to make sure there's no illegal uh, illegal um, or unpaid. I would say it's not illegal in the Netherlands. Unpaid downloading because they think that their TV on demand, a uh, pay TV would go up. Uh, but the, the ones selling the broadband would be incredibly unhappy because the broadband use would, would go would go down. And which part is making the most money? The broadband, not the TV on the mat. And and that I thought was an interesting <coughs> thought. And, and you can tell me whether they're right or wrong. That but they said we're making our money on selling broadband, and it, it will not be replaced by making money on selling uh, films on demand. Um, well, you picked on uh, a company that has done wonderful things in, in Ireland and has fought uh, against uh, restrictions every step of the way uh, and have stood up where Aircom uh, refused to stand up. Um, I think their logic is, uh, is very flawed, but <laughs> I'm happy that that's the logic that they're, that they're using. Um, the, if you if you if you look at the, the types of companies that have the biggest interest in, um, in limiting what their consumers have access to, and then you look at which company, which types of companies have introduced filtering and blocking first, there's a remarkable correlation. So the um, the mobile operators were the first to introduce feedback inspection. They were the first to enter into an agreement with the European Commission for uh, mass blocking of, of content from across Europe. And 
They're the most <coughs> non-neutral access providers to, uh, to internet content. It's not a coincidence. Um, and then the, the next biggest are the uh, are the, uh, the incumbent operators, and they were the next ones in line to want to introduce voluntary measures. So uh, the voluntary measures and and um, limited internet kind of go hand in hand, and the, the voluntary measures are therefore actually quite welcome from, uh, from some of these providers. I think we'll continue with next questions, topics. So the next question has been partially answered. Um, whether Active would be asking signatory states to promote a defined system where right holders and internet provider will enforce the um, Well, following what we've already said, uh, ISP could become a frontier between the content provider and the users, and it would be contrary to net neutrality. Um, the thing is that on a democratic and open market, it will only lead to anti-competitive impact. It will only have an anti-competitive impact. But um, in less developed countries, it would create a even greater damage. So um, it will support and legitimize informal arrangement, like uh, the censorship and protectionism we uh, can see in China. Um, yesterday, the BBC said that uh, China was moving towards more censorship on the internet, so it's kind of scary. And um, even if we look at a very basic example, like Facebook, um, recently Facebook has removed um, people from its website just because saying, well, they are using nicknames, so you have to use your proper name to be on Facebook, and uh, in fact they were just kind of opponents to certain regimes, like Michael Anti in China, who has been removed from Facebook, and they argued that it was because he used his nickname. Um, and, um, yeah, and, um, yeah, something to add. <laughs> on the, the BBC story, it was specifically that the, the Chinese government is working with a number of large Intermediaries in order to uh, to implement this uh, censorship regime. So we're in the barking mad situation where the EU is pr promoting a trade uh, agreement, which works on the basis of in in the digital chapter of informal arrangements with internet companies, and exactly the same <coughs> approach informal arrangements with internet companies is what drives the world's most successful national protectionism model, namely uh, the one in China, which is also used for censorship. So the most successful um, protectionism model is a tool for promoting trade uh, in, in ACTA, which seems like a somewhat of a contradiction. To, uh, to um, so yeah, and um, there have been issues in France about Charlie Hebdo uh, last week publishing uh, Charlie Hebdo and not Charlie Hebdo, and um, Facebook has blocked access from. Well, the page is still there, but the owner of the page can't access it and can't remove anything which comes on it. So uh, and they are starting saying that it's. Because it's not a physical person, but that they have infringed the terms and conditions of Facebook. Um, so, um, yeah, I have to be just between the user and the content. Um, the last question has been kind of already answered. Um, it's about the intermediaries being the gatekeepers to markets, and um, well, there is that, it could be so. That's it. The questions get to Okay. Thank you very much. And hello from my side. We just changed uh, seats because Judith had to go. Um, and we are coming also to the last topic now, uh, which I was intended to chair. So um, thank you for uh, first of all to Idri and. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if there are questions directly to 
those questions been answered? Not at that stage. So um, perhaps I have a last question because you um, you you state very often. I mean, and that's the case with the uh, finally negotiated agreement that uh, ACTA may be going in a specific direction, maybe infringing uh, fundamental rights and maybe uh, bringing the ISPs into being gatekeepers. Um, what had to change that this maybe wouldn't exist anymore? I mean, we cannot change after, but perhaps therefore we could explain why there's also um, a danger that maybe exists. I don't know if you, if you get that. So I, I just think about is there um, is there a real threat to this, or is it just theoretically? Um, a conscious decision was made to not to use the words fair process in in ACTA um, and replace sorry due process of law in ACTA and replace it with fair process. Um, that conscious decision can only be interpreted as um, undermining uh, the rule of law. Um, so, for me, that's un unquestionably um, uh, a major question mark over the uh, legality. Um, the cooperation, um, as explained by the, by the priority documents, appears also unquestionably to be uh, in danger of. Um, restricting fundamental rights. The injunctions, as we discussed earlier, if we look at what the Belgian courts decided, and we imagine that in another country outside, then uh, there's an issue. And um, on ISP liability, where there's a, an explicit um, promotion of one set of rights over other rights, in contradiction to the uh, ECJ rule. Um, there are several examples of in my mind, unquestionably uh, illegal aspects to uh, to act on. Um, it's not the, the either <coughs> this can be explained, and Christian has asked twice for them to explain uh, the fair process, um, <coughs> or the um, actor is is illegal. So there are there are points. There are lots of points where you can say if and maybe, but there are several points that I think you can say unquestionably. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that was uh, a quite good overview about what uh, is very seen very critical also in treaty terms and in legal terms uh, in the UNCTAD agreement. Uh, you also stated that there will be the ECJ judgment on the 25th of November. We are very much looking forward to it as we all read the uh, General Advocate's uh, opinion on that, and um, I think that this is perhaps uh, a good moment to also talk 10 minutes about the possible referral of uh, ACTA to the European Court of Justice, uh, which we as the Green Group intended to ask for and uh, hope that other groups also will be uh, asking for that and uh, that we have the opportunity to vote in this uh, house on the question um, which is now uh, possible with international agreements if the European Parliament uh, asks for an opinion um, on this uh, ACTA agreement of the European Court of Justice. So um, I would propose that um, we perhaps have the first round about the question um, when such a, such a request would make sense at the moment uh, as a Green Group or as in the Internet Core Group which is dealing with this topic. We decided to, uh, to wait for the um, signature or the decision of the Council to sign ACTA or to authorize the signature to the Commission and then uh, ask for uh, such an opinion, hopefully together with other groups. So I hope that there would be a cross-groups initiative uh, until then, uh, in December or January, when we uh, will perhaps vote on such a request. And uh, then, of course, uh, it would make sense to have as many people in as possible to uh, campaign for 
such a um, vote because at the moment I don't see um, that we would hinder ACTA from getting into force if there would not be a, a significant uh, intervention by the European Court of Justice which would have grounds if they follow your concerns also from the legal perspective. So I think it, it would be a possibility. But uh, if there are any remarks on the question how to ask for such an opinion or uh, which questions also should be in, that would be very interesting uh, for us. So I don't know if you want to start coming in. Uh, well, um, it's obviously uh, quite a new process in, uh, in the European Parliament. Uh, we've been working on a, on a set of questions for, for some time. Um, the rules have been clarified to us uh, on an ongoing basis. We had a clarification yesterday that the word limit isn't really a word limit, um, which is uh, helpful if confusing. Um, the, the questions are very important because it needs to be clear, that it needs to be unequivocal that the questions are being asked because the questions are serious and not as a delaying tactic. Um, we need to be very uh, precise about what questions we want to ask, and then the signatories, if it's done on a signatory basis as opposed to a, a political group basis, then um, it, needs, it needs to have, a, um, signatories need to be broadly equivalent to the strength of the political groups, so that it is a, a real cross-party uh, initiative, and can be clearly seen as, as such. Um, so, um, I'm starting discussions with uh, people in the other political groups, and um, we'll circulate texts once, we, uh, once we've uh, digested the, the latest round of um, information about what the rules are. Um, the 200 word limit is, is flexible, apparently, and the 200 word limit is just <laughs> incredibly difficult to, to work with. So now that we have a few more words, it's a bit easier. Okay, Eric. Um, as you mentioned, the, uh, <coughs> uh, it's a new instrument, or it, it, this has been only used twice uh, uh, under this country, but I think that you could actually ask the court for opinion also before. But uh, uh, under this one, it has only been used now twice, first with the uh, Morocco Fisheries Agreement, uh, uh, that was a 74 MP cross party initiative. And recently, on the PNR agreement between the European Union and Australia. Uh, so, uh, in the first case, I would say that the analysis and the, and the arguments were excellent uh, and also promoted by prominent MPs like Andrew Duff, who is a constitutionalist. And, um, had more support, but maybe there was no uh, uh, public awareness or not campaigning in favor of one or the other uh, decision. Uh, in, the, in the second case, maybe the argument was right, but it was also very late to kind of throw in the question to over refer to the court in an ongoing procedure that has been quite elaborate and complicated in, in the response to the committee. So, uh, if this would be then like a combination and also with a proper preparation uh, among civil society and, and in, in the media uh, awareness of what, that this would happen and there could be a chance of a majority but it's still hard work uh, yeah maybe a lot of questions the phone. Not at the moment, I mean, I, I would say, I'm uh, right. Yeah, what about timing? <coughs> when to uh, My personal opinion, but, but people inside the parliament might have a better feeling than I did. My, my feeling, ideally, because um, we need to gather as much support as possible, the longer we have, the more support we can gather. So, uh, my, my personal feeling would be whenever it would be uh, likely to go, the consent vote would, go, would be likely to go to plenary, aiming for the plenary for that. Um, which would be the latest? I'm not an expert, but I, I, my impression is that 
the, the, the timetable is not set in any committee or we're in a flux in a, in a flexible situation where it can, things are interrelated and depend on each other. And for example, if the civil liberties committee engage deeply in the in, in ACTA and with the rapporteur, as Judith mentioned in the previous intervention, uh, wants to go to the, deeply into the analysis, then that committee, I would suspect, would insist on having proper time to prepare the report, which would then influence other committees that would have to take their decision into account, in particular the uh, International Trade Committee. Uh, further, uh, there's one uh, issue that I'm not 100% sure of, and um, that's the role of the conference presidents in, in deciding on whether to put the, the resolution, such a resolution on the agenda, uh, whether or not um, it, it requires uh, uh, a majority or well, a decision of the conference of presidents to put it on the agenda, or if there's <coughs> other interpretation of uh, a political group or 74, and maybe then in the case of that we would have more MPs, 76 MPs have access to the agenda without uh, the consent of the conference of presidents. This, I'm not 100% sure what, which way it goes there. So uh, uh, in this situation, I, to, to gather broad understanding and support for that we need uh, a proper opinion from the court when so many issues are unclear on the table, I think that we can safely start to work on that. Yeah. Um, Martin, but first of all, let me just clarify. I think now, as we have clarified many procedures, uh, it's clear that there is no space for maneuver in the Conference of Presidents to hinder such questions to be raised by the competent uh, parts in, in the uh, rules of procedure. So, um, if a group or 74 members are asking for such a question, it has to be voted in the plenary. That was also with the Australia PNR now very visible because it was only one group asking for it yeah. very short notice. Uh, but Carl, uh, uh, Martin and then Carl. I was involved in both of the uh, <coughs> opinion, or on to both questions to, to ask the CJ for an opinion on Morocco fisheries. Morocco agriculture, you didn't name this one. And my net impression is that it is not any longer a due diligence instrument. So it's very new and we didn't win any of the cases that were put up so far, but it is not any longer a legal due diligence instrument in which we as lawmakers make <coughs> sure that the things that we are to decide on are heavy legal base. I mean, on Morocco it was about the West Sahara question, something which the UN really tipped for exactly 30 years, and it was not enough to convince the majority. Uh, I'm in, very much in favor of going the direction of an ECJ opinion. I just say, maybe to Eric, it is not a question of the density of legal arguments. If we win a vote to go to the ECJ, we have won on act. It will be the same, almost the same kind of balance of votes also in the final yes and no. It doesn't make any difference any longer. Maybe we are a political house and these things are judged in terms of their political ethics. It's my net impression, but I just say this my net impression. Uh, I agree, it's generally true. But in ACTA, we won a few votes and we lost a few votes. So it's really important how we do it to win this time. Uh, and the closer we come to a real agreement, the more difficult it is to win the vote, I think. That's also true. But uh, my point, I forgot it because you said, uh, let's see, my real point was, yeah, uh, legal, legal, legal. Um, no, ultimately. Yeah, okay. um, my name is Christian Engstrom, I'm a member for, for the Swedish Pirate Party in, in the Green Group. Uh, as I understand it, uh, it's clear that, that, that ACTA is, is a mixed agreement, which means it has to be ratified by, by, by the member states, as well, pre presumably by, by the parliaments in, in the member states. So, could, could, could somebody cl clarify how, how it should be, be uh, ratified in member states? 
and what, what, what the timing schedule looks look for that as a background to when the European Parliament might, might or might not take up the issues. Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to come in, but uh, I think generally with shared uh, competence agreements, it's always the question of national procedures, how member states ratifies um, such an agreement that could be a parliament, that could be only the government, a governmental decision. So it's different in between the member states and also the lengths of procedure seems to be different, but uh, the experience with shared competence agreements is that uh, if it's shared competence, it takes one to two years more to get into force. But perhaps some, somebody else, uh, Martin, has dealt with it very often, so please come. Uh, I cannot say which country will take how long, but in a lot of the range of agreements you see that after two or three years they're not ratified by all member states, so it's very normal. But that doesn't mean necessarily that it cannot be taken to force. I mean, it depends on the, on, the, on, the, on the proposal, and it could be that it will be entering into force before it's been ratified by all the member states. Yes, and what about the deadline? I think there's a deadline for uh, 1st of May 2013 uh, for at least six uh, parties to have ratified. Um, I don't know. I, I think that this deadline is not uh, a part of the internal EU uh, procedure, but of course if the EU cannot ratify with all its member states until that deadline, mm -hmm. it will not be part of the six uh, necessary partners of ACTA uh, to let it get into force or let it fall. Um, and um, I don't know about the issue regarding the other partners where there are also difficulties and if these six <coughs> members until 2013 are um, uh, reachable for after. I don't think that's an issue. Um, the, the U.S., for example, is pushing its, its uh, TPP uh, agreement, which is uh, active plus. Um, so that will provide, um, if the Americans have their way, that will provide uh, plenty of signatures by the year after next. So um, as, as amusing as, as the thought of ACTA uh, following the year after next, because nobody signed it, is, I think it's unlikely. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, it was about the strategy because even if we suspect this procedure will take some time, in order to get this majority, that is difficult to get. I think it's important that we don't, uh, the people who are hesitant wouldn't perceive it as an obstruction to a delaying tactic. Yeah. And therefore, I think it also media wise could be a good strategy to have this question, opinion. Uh, signed by enough members and prepared so the same day the council takes the decision of yeah go ahead ratify this uh, we should table this question uh, then it's not a delaying tactic and we we can prepare everything in advance and just table it the same day and have it <coughs> signed so i think that would be a good strategy because then that's the same day that there will be some attention also so we might get in our initiative in the media reports about the council decision that depends on the date of the council decision, of course, uh, which we don't know at the moment, I guess. But, uh, please uh, try to get information in if you have some. So, uh, But that would mean uh, sticking to December, um, presenting a, a request. So, I don't know. If we had just stated it would be good if we had more time, so we have to see. Uh, I think when we come to decision, is please go. Uh, there's another thought uh, struck me as uh, as you were talking, which is that um, the uh, communication on the commerce directive comes out in December, and there will be an initiative report in, uh, probably starting in January, February. In uh, in two of the, the committees, um, and uh, it would become increasingly obvious that the uh, that does have an, have an impact on 
European lawmaking, uh, even if it doesn't contradict the, the, um, the key on a particular point. So the longer it goes on, the more this is going to be obvious. Uh, but we, we need a text, uh, and we need to uh, schlep around to the Parliament to get a signature. Very good. So we'll try to do that, and um, hopefully we will have uh, very quickly many supporters on that way, and uh, then the chance to raise awareness in the upcoming months uh, on the votes we are taking up on ACTA. It seems to be that there are many concerns and many points we really uh, have if it's about ACTA, why we are voting against, why we are uh, against this form of uh, enforcement treaty. And uh, I thank you very much for coming here, Marie and uh, Joe, and um, all the others also, of course. And yeah, I hope uh, we will have another meeting with uh, in between the next two, three months with the last steps how to go on um, campaigning on ACTA in the European Parliament and abroad. Thanks.